The world is a very different place from the last time we met you on this show. War has broken out, not just the war of bombs and missiles, but also the silent war of sanctions, which will have an effect on the lives of millions of people. Across the world, people are asking one question, how will this end? We'll be discussing all this and more on this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. Before we get into these questions, let's first take a look at the military situation on the ground right now. As we know, the Russian attack began on February 24th. And over the past seven to eight days, it has focused on four main axes. The first axis, as we see, is around the capital city of Kiev, Ukraine's capital city. There, a vast Russian contingent is awaiting some miles away from the city. The second major axis is around the city of Kharkiv. The third major axis is in the Donbass region. And the fourth major axis is from Crimea. From all these areas, Russian troops have entered Ukrainian territory. A key city of Kherson has been captured. The city of Odessa is what seems to be one key target. The city of Mariupol seems to be another key target. The important question, of course, is will an attack take place on Kiev? If so, what will happen? To know more about this, we have with us Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, so first of all, we've seen the military situation on the ground and we've seen the specific directions in which the Russian troops have advanced over the past few days. So could you maybe take us through what seem on, of course, it's difficult to completely analyze it, but what seem to be the significance of these key directions in which the Russian advances were taking place? I think that's a very important question. Of course, it also has to do with what the end goal uh, Russia has with respect to Ukraine. It has said the denazification, it has said the demilitarization of Ukraine. Now, what does that really mean in actual practice? Does it mean uh, smashing the state itself, taking over Ukraine and then running it for some time? Is that even feasible given what we see? And after all, Ukraine is not a small country. It's a country of 40 million people, 40, 45 million people, whichever you want to count it. And, and it is the second largest uh, country in terms of area in Europe. So this is not a simple target as it might appear. So if you look at the more restricted military targets, what we, what we see from the map that we have here seems to be one is of course surround Kiev and that they have done from uh, Belarus coming side. from east, the Belarus side, and also coming from the, again, from the uh, other side, the western, the eastern side of uh, the of Kiev. The, both there is a spincer, west and east, that from which they seem to have come. And a possible encirclement of Kiev is there, though they have said that they're going to leave a corridor for the civilians to go out of. So these are, this is the Kiev situation. At the moment, we don't see an assault in Kiev that we see, in, for instance, in Kharkiv. Now, Kharkiv is, seems to be linked much more close to what has been for Russia a major issue, which is the Donbass region, which is what they said was a military action for. The Donbass region, Lugansk and Donetsk, where there is a strong Russian-speaking majority who have been under siege and who are under threat again of assaults. That's what the uh, statements have been. And the fact that there seems to have been also uh, bombardment preceding even this action. In fact, some kind of civil war equivalent has been going on this region right. for quite some time. The last part of it is that Crimea, there are two uh, arrows that you can see go. One goes to the Donbass region, so it's a kind of encirclement that they're trying, it seems. And the other is going towards Odessa, which means really looking at the Black Sea coastal region and see that it also is uh, taken away so that they have control over the Black Sea strategically and doesn't leave it in the hands of uh, Ukraine. Because there was a naval base being set up over there, Okachov uh, base that was being talked about, which could be used to attack the Russian uh, Navy in Black Sea. That was the, uh, that's the argument that we are hearing. So this arc seems to be also there by which there is an attempt to uh, take over the coastal areas. It's interesting that the one which is going from Crimea goes to Mykolov and uh, it seems to be somewhere something which doesn't really need to uh, be there for strategic purpose of controlling the Black Sea coast that we talked about. Now, it, there could be a secondary target here, which is the, a nuclear plant 
which is in Michalov Oblast province. There's a very large nuclear plant. Maybe these are also targets because one of the issues, unstated issues, really is the nuclear uh, reactors in Kiev right. and the possibility, therefore, of Kiev turning towards a more towards nuclear weapons at some point of time. So uh, is it also meant to see that this does not happen, therefore are the secondary targets? But again, Western uh, Ukraine doesn't seem to be under attack at the moment. And that, that does not, it doesn't mean that this is, can be a policy which could be extended to Western Ukraine, not from the disposition we see at the moment. Right. So this is broadly the military position. What is unfortunate is that we are seeing also now civilian casualties in Kharkiv and, uh, and it does seem that if populated areas are taken, then of course there will be civilian casualties and casualties would be high on both sides. We see a similar possibility in Mariupol right. where it seems there is a strong uh, as of but a group over there and they seem to be targets of uh, the Russian army. And they seem to be holding out as uh, as of now. So what we'll see in Mariupol could be much more bitter fighting. And Kharkiv, we are already seeing a bitter fighting in which when even an Indian student has lost his life. So all these things are things to watch at the moment. No let up in the military right. actions and no easy victories, as some people might have claimed. Nor is it showing any signs of slowing down, as people might have also speculated. So I think. They, each side is on track, claiming what they are saying, maybe, maybe overstated claims, but more or less claims that they're Ukraine claiming they're holding out in their areas and Russian advance steady and seem to be achieving the strategic goals. We do not know what the target or the timeline they have because that's something only they would know. But as of now, significant advances and a significant uh, movement of the Russian forces have taken place, it, though in, uh, the Americans and the European Europeans are claiming there is a, Russia has not used its full 150,000, 200,000. They said were ready for uh, entering Ukraine. They have not used their full force as yet. So we still have to see what is in store for the war that we are seeing. Right, Prabir. And uh, like you said, of course, one strategic aim seems to be cutting off Ukraine's access to the Black Sea. The other aspect also seems to be, in some senses, there's a demographic component as well, because the bulk of the focus seems to be in the eastern areas, where the Russian-speaking population is actually in more of a majority. And that is the other aspect of Ukraine, which people are glossing over at the moment in their hurry to look at the color of the skin and the color of the hair of the Ukrainian people. It's true, as somebody has said, his, his emotionally becomes much more uh, upset when he looks at blonde hair and uh, blue-eyed people being under attack. I think this is the deputy prosecutor of, the, of Ukraine who has said it's not a minor figure. And this kind of uh, sen sentiments we have heard of. But the point is there are deep divisions within Ukraine. And uh, part of it is what Putin was very emotional about that Lenin created Ukraine by handing over Russian territory. The reality is that a lot of Russia's emotions are bundled up with Kiev because they look up the expansion of Kievian Rus is what is the foundation of Russia is how they look at it. But if we forget the history, because this is also the Kosovo history, if you remember, with Serbia, if you forget about that, then there is no question that if you look at the eastern part of Ukraine, then that is linguistically, as this map will show, that is linguistically uh, much more of Russian speakers and also Russian ethnicity. Exactly. If you take the western part of Ukraine, this side, which is there, you will see that the Ukrainian language, what is now being called the Ukrainian language, that dominates. And if you look at the political map, the 2010 elections between Yanukovych and Julia Timoshenko, then you will see the map very closely onto the linguistic boundaries of Ukraine. So this has been the underlying division which is there, as you know, after the Maidan uh, revolution, as it is called, 2014, when Yanukovych was overthrown. And this was sort of orchestrated between the uh, Newland, Mrs. Newland, 
then uh, you had uh, the um, American ambassador in Ukraine at the time discussing with the State Department officials, discussing who should be the new president. Right. And uh, we shouldn't bother about uh, either Union. European Union or we shouldn't bother about who won the election. Yanukovych right. won the election. We need to overthrow him and put our man over there. So this was the turning point where actually the the, shall we say, the sham of uh, Ukraine state being independent of the European Union and the United States, essentially the NATO powers, was removed. And it was made clear that this is what we are going to now control. Ukraine is what we are now going to control. And that is the, that is the history behind what we saw later as the Donbass revolt, because there was an attempt also to deny Russian language, 50% of your speaker or 45% of your people speak Russia as their first language and think that's their ethnicity, then giving it a place was either necessary or you are talking of a separation. Separation happened in Czechoslovakia, okay. where the Czech and the Slovak population mutually decided to separate. It happened very brutally in uh, Yugoslavia, where Serbian, Croatian, and what's called the Bosnians separated. And uh, this again, uh, was NATO was instrumental, as you know, in breakup, as well as finally bombing Serbia to uh, quote unquote liberate Kosovo, which still remains as a statelet as of date. So this battle to break up uh, Ukraine is not; uh, it doesn't happen independently of the fact that in 2014 an overthrow of an elected government and not giving space then to Russian ethnicities come up in terms of language and schools. Russian was a language which was, to, uh, was supposed to be in lots of places, the video instruction. That is stopped. It's not going to stop, it's supposed to be taught. You have the language in television, radio, even newspapers, Russian language, all of these instruments of public opinion being taken away. So all of this was seen as obliteration of his identity of a section of the people. Now that is also the reason Russia came in in support of Donbass and has now also militarily targeted that, that region. Right. So I think this, this part of it, uh, that's why they don't seem to be at the moment showing much military interest on the west, uh, power, western part or west of Kiev. And Kiev seems to be their target in order to see and to show to the world that they are controlling the capital militarily. So this is at the moment what we see. What further lies in store for us, we don't know. Absolutely. But these are, these are the historical currents which Putin has talked about. These are the currents that we know from what we have seen and what history tells us. And this is where it seems to be at the moment. Right. Rabin, of course, another front on this whole issue is that of sanctions. We have seen that major Russian banks are going to be cut off from SWIFT on the 12th of March, I believe. We have also seen that uh, there has been an exemption granted to purchasing Russian oil and Russian natural gas as well. So those supplies are still set to continue. The Russian central bank's reserves, foreign reserves have been blocked. So a lot of questions remaining really on one, how exactly is any, how exactly is trade going to continue in the first place? And two, does Russia have any kind of responses to the, the situation or is it, are, they, are they going to face a major crisis? Well, you know, the crisis is of an uncertain character at the moment because no, nobody has ever foreseen mm -hmm. a sanctioned bank, a sanctioning of a central bank of this magnitude. Russia is not a small player economically. It has, it's a primary producer of a number of goods, including, of course, oil and gas, coal, and also imports a lot of stuff. So this, it has an economic weight in the international uh, scenario. Therefore, sanctioning a central bank of this size is something which is uncharted territory for everybody. Right. Now, there seems to be two parts to it. Let me go over the two parts. One is the whole foreign exchange reserves. Now, those foreign exchange reserves are quote unquote frozen. And uh, what does it mean when you freeze Russian reserves, which are, for instance, in dollars or in euros? We don't know. Because does it mean that Russia is therefore uh, losing, means expropriation of the reserves? Because that would be a step beyond what the, the parties are saying. 
So the freezing of the assets of this variety, which is what they would then be able to use for payment of things that they buy, they can't pay for that now. So effectively freezing of the assets to me is equivalent to expropriation. Mm -hmm. So that is a very, very significant act of war. So this is economic war. Let's call it what it is. The second part of this is that they have not, as you said, sanctioned the banks that deal with oil and gas. Now, oil and gas, the banks, Gazprom Bank, for instance, is one of them. There's another bank which deals with uh, gas and oil uh, exports. Now, if they export the oil and gas, what are they going to be paid in? Right. And how will Russia receive that money? If they're paid in dollars or they're paid in euros, now, they can't take it inside because normally what they would do is either buy stuff in dollars or in euros and export it to Russia, transact that, that dollar or uh, euro account. Can they do it even if they are not cut off from the SWIFT? Are they allowed to do it? This is one question. If they bring it to Russia, then of course what happens is they are, the Russian central bank then is essentially holding dollar reserves or euro reserves and then that also gets frozen. Exactly. So what happens to this is not clear. So the idea that Russia would accumulate frozen assets, if that is the idea, then that won't fly. So Russia has no in interest or incentive to do it. So that is one big question, that how the non-sanctioned banks which deal with energy will still continue. And these are not small amounts that you are talking about because uh, 20, I think uh, about 25 to 30% of uh, uh, EU's gas comes from Russia. Uh, for Germany, for instance, 40% uh, or 50% of their coal comes from Russia. Uh, for United States, heavy crude. After Venezuela, Russia is the only supplier since Venezuela is embargoed. So that they're getting from uh, Russia and they don't want to sanction that because that would be a huge hole in their uh, production right. of uh, oil. So all of this, how they're going to handle, can they have their cake and eat it too, is the issue that we have to face. face. And the argument that they, those banks can continue with business as usual seems to be that there is going to be a very asymmetric behavior that they expect out of Russia. And Russia, of course, have the possibility of retaliation. Right. We have to see whether this money can be used for, again, external account, settling their external account or not. And if not, then we are in a different situation. Of course, they have the option of doing the oil and gas and coal uh, transfers in renminbi. Hmm. So Chinese could be used, Chinese currency could be used. But more important than any of this is, this is a significant blow to the primacy of the dollar in future because every country in the world will have to think that if the United States want, the European Union and the United States go together, if they want, they have the ability now to throw any country and seize their foreign assets. And that is an important issue. The Russian response has been, of course, to declare basically their currency is not convertible. 80% of any investment has, that has been made in Russia cannot be taken out. So there are various capital controls they're going. So the external account, we can go to a scenario where, for instance, which uh, India had once upon a time, and Russia also had a non-convertible currency. Right. So that is one way of responding, and I think that they have already started. So those, those things are there. But seizing of assets, and you can see the amount of assets we are talking about, except for the gold and what they hold in China, the Chinese bank, as the graphic shows, the rest of it is all held either in the foreign banks or in liquid assets, which we don't know what or where it is held. But since they are dollar or euro assets, right. they are at definitely at risk of being frozen. They cannot be transacted. So essentially, that's a kind of indirect seizure of their foreign assets. Right. And Prabir, finally, like I said, the question that's on everyone's mind right now, which is that, is there a possibility for both sides to withdraw from the current uh, face off that they're in? We do know that one round of talks did take place. Uh, no senior officials, of course, participating in those round of talks. They both presented a series of demands which 
would probably have been what are called maximalist demands. But in the coming days, is there a possibility where, of course, difficult to predict, but is there a possibility where there could be some kind of negotiations and this immediate conflict ends? I don't think Ukraine is, is even a player in all this because for Russia is concerned, they want to deal with NATO. And if NATO is not on the table, uh, Ukraine is in, not in a position to negotiate anything because Ukraine at the moment has become essentially uh, in the hands of uh, NATO completely. It has virtually given up its autonomy, as we can see. So the off-ramp has to come either from Russia saying, OK, now we are willing to negotiate. We'll stop the uh, advance. I don't see them doing it because at the moment, why should they do it if the other side is not reciprocating right. anything? So the entire exercise they have done seems to then go into a deep freeze and it doesn't get them anywhere. So I think they will then push, push on for some tangible benefits. On the European Union and uh, NATO side, European Union at the moment has more or less surrendered its autonomy to the United States. And one of the fallouts of Afghanistan, we had said, is the weakening of NATO. We seem to see European Union now much more uh, integrated with within NATO. Germany talking about increasing its military spending, etc. So what we have to talk is, does the United States offer an off-ramp, which is essentially NATO's expansion in Ukraine and in the Baltic states, putting nuclear missiles over there, putting uh, missile batteries over there, right. unless these come under discussion. I do not see there is an immediate off-ramp to this uh, war at the moment. So both sides have to come down to the key question, where does the military balance now uh, remain? And is the military balance is somewhere in between the maximalist positions of Russia and the maximalist positions of, the, of NATO? Or is there a possibility somewhere in between? And both sides can reluctantly but come together. Now, if they don't, we are facing a very, very dangerous time because these are all nuclear powers. So I don't think we should really uh, neglect that dimension of the problem. And there are 50 nuclear reactors uh, in Ukraine. That's not a small number. Anything happens over there, you're going to see another Chernobyl in that part of the world. Let's not forget, it has happened once, it can easily happen again. Absolutely. And the midst of war to keep nuclear reactors safe, it's not an easy task. So I think all of those things we have to take into account. How to Russia wages war and how can it withdraw from it? And how can NATO stop its rather reckless march towards the east, which people like Kissinger, Keenan, George Keenan, the doyen of American foreign policy, all of them had said, this is not the way to go. We should really think much more about it. And this is not a long term. It's not going to be of help to the world or to NATO or to the United States. I think that is something we need to put back on the table. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabir. The coming days, of course, will be crucial. We'll be coming back with mapping fault lines to look at some of these developments. Until then, keep watching News Click.